If you want to turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, and the general theme, let's remind us here, the general theme, I think it's captured by this picture, the young man reading this letter that he has received. And there's the, the other men that are gathered around, and Timothy is reading this letter. Paul had passed through, he left, he sent Timothy this letter. Paul writes the book of First Timothy with great authority. It's an authoritative letter telling Timothy, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. He didn't have to tell Timothy that. Timothy knew that. Why did he write so authoritatively and telling him, now look, I'm an apostle because Timothy is being empowered by this letter to address the things in the church at Ephesus where he is. Timothy, who do you think you are to, to try to straighten this out? Look, I've got this letter from the apostle and he tells me this is what I need to do. So I'm going to read this letter to you so you'll understand why I'm doing this. I'm coming with the authority of that apostle. And that's coming with the authority of God. Because Paul was writing by the authority of God to this man, Timothy. Now I charge you, this is what you deal with for that church in Ephesus. So we've gone through three chapters. He's setting things in order in that church. How to behave in the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Now we're getting into the second part of that letter. When we come to chapter 4, we're about halfway through. And uh, created to be received with thanksgiving is the words I picked out of this that I'm going to be emphasizing here as we look at this. Here is why. Watch for those words when we read the text. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to be abstained from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving. There are the words. Of them which believe and know the truth, for every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. All right. You seen this picture? Um, this is very familiar. I remember growing up, Dad used to hang this in his uh, study at the uh, church building, Dad being a preacher. And this was, this was in his study, this picture. Don't, don't you just, the emotion up there of this old man in his coat and he's praying for his bread. And I've always thought that's some kind of soup there, his, his meal, that bread and that soup. He's been studying his Bible. That's what that big book must be. Has his glasses laying on it. He's been reading his Bible. And now he's going to eat. And he's thanking God for his food. He's all alone, isn't he? But even though he's all by himself, before he eats, he's going to thank God for what he has. That is just such a sweet picture there. Here's another one that, that struck with me. I remember seeing this one in a picture book of Norman Rockwell paintings that uh, I looked through. And then you've seen this one. Don't you just love the grandmother? That's got to be who that is, the grandmother in this picture. And there's her little boy. And look what she's up against. Look, look at all the people around. They're all busy doing their thing. Now, the men in the corner, I don't know if you see the men up in the corner. They, they, they've noticed her. Those two men, they're just barely on the edge of the picture. On the other side, looks like they're busy with what the newspaper's there. And then these two young fellas, I mean, these are two cool dudes that are clueless. They think they're so cool, don't they? But they're clueless, and they're sitting there, and they're looking. Look what this grandmother's up against. 
she is going to try to raise this little boy in a worldly world to try to be a godly man. And look what she's up against. And I look at that picture, and I think she's going to do it too. She'll do it. That power, that grandmother's faith, and that prayer in this setting, we pray for our food. Before, and the little boy is just sitting there with his grandmother. Before. Boy, what is he learning from that grandmother that day in that, that busy restaurant in this worldly scene? Well, praying for our food. I grew up in a house that uh, we never had a meal, but that someone didn't say the blessing. That's what we'd call it, the blessing. Now, when you bless the food, it's not that you make the food more nutritious. It doesn't. It doesn't make the food taste better. It doesn't make the food healthier. When we say we bless the food, bless the meal, what, what that really means is that word bless is used in the sense of thanksgiving. You're thanking God for the food. Another expression used to express that is uh, saying grace. Saying grace. That word grace is used in the sense of thanksgiving. That's what it's doing. So if you're thanking God for the food or you're saying the blessing or you are saying grace, it's all, you're just saying it different ways, but it's all talking about thanking God for that food. Now Jesus taught us to pray for our food. In that model prayer he gave in the Sermon on the Mount, among the things he said in Matthew 6, 11, Give us this day our daily bread. That's what I think when I think of that old man praying over that loaf of bread there, you know. He's thankful for the daily bread. Now that means a lot more than bread, doesn't it? I mean, the, the sufficient for the day. So give us what we need today. And we don't have to have what we need for the next 10 years. We just need to get through today and tomorrow will be another day and God supplies us our needs as our days come. And the example there is bread. But that's what we're thankful for, isn't it? And this may not necessarily be before a meal here, but he's teaching us to pray for our food. But we have this example. You remember when the multitudes came out to see Jesus and the Lord told his apostles, They'll need something to eat. And they said, well, we, don't, we wouldn't have enough money. We've got to send them away. There's no way we can even buy the, much food for these. And Andrew says, well, here's a little boy with five loaves and two fishes. And you know how Jesus divided it among the multitudes. Here's what it says. In Matthew chapter 14 and verse 19. Looking up to heaven, he blessed and break." And gave the loaves to the disciples and the disciples to the multitude. He thanked God for the five loaves and two fishes, didn't he? He thanked God before they had their meal. I, I think about the, uh, the, the Lord's Supper, that last Passover. They call it the last supper. The last meal Jesus had with his disciples on that night before he was betrayed. After that meal, they'd been eating their meal, and then it says in Matthew 26, 26 and 27, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it okay so that, that's not before the meal and that's not even for the main meal but for this memorial meal he stopped let's thank God for this bread let's thank God for this cup later on today we're going to take the Lord's Supper and we're going to follow this pattern in how we do it and we'll have two prayers and there'll be one before we pass the bread and one before we pass the cup. I've been places where they just say one prayer and then pass the bread and the cup after one prayer. 
I, I don't really like that. Um, you know, we, we can't go wrong to do it the way the Lord did it, can we? Let's just do it the way he did it. And we don't need to rush through the Lord. So, so we can get, the, get past this and get that done. Let's have two prayers like the Lord did. And let's think about what we're doing and thank the Lord for this. And then there's the other story. And Paul is a prisoner on that ship going to Rome. And the storm came and blew them out. And they couldn't see the stars and they didn't, they didn't know where they were. And there was land ahead and they were afraid for the land being ahead because they didn't know they could be smashed on the rocks. In Acts 27, and while the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat. Now that word meat means food. Okay, take, take some food. It doesn't mean that it was some kind of a animal product necessarily, but they need to take some kind of food. He bought the, sought them all to take meat, saying, this is the 14th day that ye have tarried and continued fasting and have taken nothing. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not a hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, now watch this. He took bread and gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. How many were on that ship? How many? You look it up. It was over a hundred, wasn't it? I forgot how many. There's a lot of people on that ship. Gathered them all in the presence of them all. He took that. He gave thanks to God. And when he'd broken it, he began to eat, and they were all a good cheer, and they also took some meat. We've got private prayer, thanking God for our food. And we've got public prayer, thanking God for our food. I know <clears throat> in this part of the country, it's not uncommon to see people in a restaurant that will... Before, once they're served and before they eat, you'll just see them bow and have a prayer before their meal. Now, that's not, that doesn't happen everywhere. I tell you, that happens here. And uh, other places in the South where I've been there, I've been across the country in places where it, that would really draw a lot of attention. If someone, if they did that, it just almost the whole restaurant would say, what are they doing? Because... Because that's not as common. Down here, it's so common that you, you can just kind of not just, just you kind of notice it and go on. Now, I've worked with people that were raised like I was, and they're taught, you pray for your food before you eat. You thank God for your food. And uh, I've seen them there. We're all sitting around the table. Now, this is a work bunch, you know, and, and there's all kind of work things and worldly things all about it. And yet, when they get their food, here's what they'll do. They'll, they'll get their food, and then they, and then they'll eat. I mean, it's just a moment, and you can tell they have paused, and they're not with us. They, all of a sudden, they left the table. They're sitting right there, but they're not with us. They're with their God, and they just stop. I know what they're doing. They stop just a minute. Thank God for the food, and then they, they're not doing it to be seen. That's not the purpose. It's, it's just, they know they need to thank God for their food. What a good habit to get into, to, to pray. If you eat three times a day, thank God for your food three times a day. If you're by yourself, do it when you're by yourself, like that man in that picture. Stop, say a prayer of thanks, and then eat. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 3, Paul's warning Timothy about some that would forbid things that God allows. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats. Now that, that was a, a, an important thing in the early church. It, it, there were three things here going on in that early church. One, there were the, the Jews that had become Christians. And now they're not under the law of Moses. But you know all their life, they do, you don't eat this. That this, is, this is not, I think the, it's not a Bible word, but they say the, the word kosher, 
This is not something Jews eat. And they're not, they're not going to do it. There are certain meats they weren't going to eat. And some of these Jews thought the Gentiles needed to keep the law of Moses. They would command that, no, you can't eat that. Well, there's another problem. Gentiles. They had grown up being taught and understanding that if they ate meat that had been offered to idols, then they are having a meal with that idol. That's part of their meal. So you go down to the marketplace and you get the meat that had been offered to, to, uh, to somebody, Dionysius or Diana or somebody, somebody, and you bring it. Now you're having the meal with them. And, the, and so they're sitting there with that meat and they're thinking, I'm going to abstain from idolatry. I'm not going to eat meat that's been offered to idols. Well, it would bother them because they're thinking, okay, now I, I'm getting back into idolatry. I've done that. And so they didn't want to eat that. And they didn't want others to do it. Oh, don't, don't eat that. That's been offered to an idol. And then there's this other idea that was going around in Asia. We're going to read about this in just a minute in Colossians. And that is that somehow you are going to be more righteous if you deprive yourself if you humiliate yourself some way that that's going to make you more righteous here it is in the book of Colossians 2 18 through 22 let no man beguile your reward in a voluntary humility that is hum humiliating yourself in something that's allowed and then I'm going to talk about here in just a minute the worship of angels. Just remember that because we'll get back to that. Vainly puffed up by their fleshly mind. They're thinking, if I don't eat, if I don't eat uh, this meat, I'm going, to, I'm going to be more righteous. Well, that's just vainly puffed up. It says, why as though living in the world you're subject to ordinances. Now these are, here are these ordinances. Touch not, taste not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using. But now look what it says, ordinances after the commandments and doctrines of men. This is not something God said don't touch. It's not something God said don't taste or don't. This is something man said. You'll be more righteous if you don't wear shoes. You know, if you just go barefoot all winter, you'll be more righteous if you suffer in the cold, if you deprive yourself of sleep. If you abstain from meats, if you don't marry, you'll be more righteous. Look, these are the commandments of men, not of God. It says, so which things indeed have a show of wisdom and worship. They look, think they're showing it by how righteous they are and humility, but they're neglecting the body and not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So there'd be those commanding to abstain from meats for various reasons. There's nothing wrong with that. It's meets what God created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now look, you need to believe and know the truth and you'll know what you can do and what you should not do by believing and knowing the truth. Now, associating on that, that's down here in verse 5. The word of God, that tells you, not men. The word of God tells you this. So, God created these things to be received with thanksgiving. Um, we got grandkids. We got 10 of them. Lori likes to give them presents. It, what, what, if, what if you're giving someone a present and they think, oh, that's nice, but I'm not going to play with it. I'm not going to play with it. Well, you would, you would want them to. You want them to be thankful and have it and enjoy that, and that's what God's done for us. He's given us things. It delights God to see us be thankful and enjoy his blessings. He said, every creature of God is good. Remember in the Genesis 1? God saw that it was good. And God saw that it, and then God saw it was very good. The creation was something God made that is good for man. And said, and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it's sanctified by the word of God in prayer. There's your prayer. You can read in God's word that these things 
are gifts of God for us to enjoy. And then in prayer, we can be thankful. So what a good habit to get into. Thank God for our food. I wanted to start at the end of that text and make sure we emphasize that. I tell you, uh, I put it in the bulletin if you hadn't read it. When I was in public school, public school, we prayed in public school. Uh, the day would begin, we'd pledge allegiance to the flag, and then the teacher, and it was always one of the boys. She never called on one of the girls. Isn't that interesting? She'd call on one of the boys to lead a prayer. And he would say, I don't, I don't remember what we prayed in the morning. I remember what we prayed at lunch. We'd have another prayer before we'd go to lunch. Uh, God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, we'd say that, and we'd all say it together. Let's say our lunch prayer. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. And one morning, the little, the little boy called on prayer. He said the lunch prayer for the morning, and we thought that was hilarious. We all just laughed at and the teacher got on to us. And she taught, you take prayer serious. Now, that was in public school that they were doing that. But uh, what a good habit. That you're not going to, your kids aren't going to learn to do this in public school. They can learn at home. They can learn at home. Just, just have a prayer. When you, and let that just be part of what. And remember, every good gift comes from God. So I wanted to start there. Let's look at the rest of this text. The Spirit speaketh experience. Presley, this is Paul writing these things by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And you never read in the Bible where people were saying, I think the Holy Spirit's trying to tell me something. They knew it's expressly. The Spirit was clear about this. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times that doesn't mean at the end of the world we're in the latter times the latter times began when Christ rose from the dead and this new time came on and it's the time of Christ and it extends to the end of the world so it would be in these latter times that some would depart from the faith don't tell me you can't fall from the faith Paul said some would depart from the faith. Look, look how he began this epistle. Uh, or, well, look in Acts 20. Acts 20. He's talking to the elders at Ephesus. He'd already told them this. Of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, draw away disciples after them. Not after the things which Paul had taught. They'd depart from that. In 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 4, how he began this epistle. Charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith. So do. Okay. Godly edifying which is in faith is what we need. Not these. Don't, don't go to these other doctrines. And some had already done that. Same chapter, same book. Verses 19 and 20. Some having put away concerning the faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I've delivered to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. They're going to have to suffer the consequences of what they've done. Maybe they'll learn not to speak evil of these good things that I've taught you. They would depart from the faith. So he's warning them, don't depart from the faith. Now here's what he says. Giving heed... To seducing spirits. You see, that's how the devil entices us. Through worldly things. Oh, have I got something for you. And then and try to draw you away from God's word. And it's seductive, isn't it? And then he says, doctrines of devils. Well, I'm not sure what that is. That's why I wanted you to remember over in Colossae it was the, the worship of angels. Remember that? Worshiping angels. Some other kind of spiritual thing to draw you away 
from what God has taught you. Just don't go after that. That They'll try to pull you way into that. And then this is how bad it gets. Speaking lies with hypocrisy. It's a lie. And they know it's a lie. And they're lying to you anyway. Now I know some false teachers are just honestly confused. But they're not all honestly confused. Some of them are just lying and they know it's a lie. And it doesn't even bother them. Their conscience is seared with a hot iron. What does that tell you about your conscience? You violate your conscience about what you know is right and wrong. And buddy, it's going to burn. You're going to feel it. And you're going to know. But you just keep doing it. You'll get over it. You'll get over it. Before long, you can do what you know is wrong. And it's not going to bother you. It's not going to bother you. Because your conscience has been seared. It's lost its feeling. It's lost its impact. And that's what some of these false teachers, they've been telling these hypocritical lies so long, it doesn't even bother them anymore. And so they're glad to steer you away. The Bible warns about those that would make merchandise of you. They're getting something out of this. And it doesn't even bother them that they know it's wrong. Well, that's where they get this forbidding to marry. There are those that think if you don't marry, you're more righteous. That's not what God said. It must have been a problem. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. They wrote Paul some questions. One of the questions was, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? Now this is talking about that intimate touching. Well, Paul said, well, that's like, you, you don't have to get married. No, you, there's nothing that requires you to get married. But it's good for a man not to touch a woman. If he don't want to touch a woman, that's good. That's good. Man, you, you don't have to do that. But now to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. That kind of tells you what this touching is here, isn't it? Now, it's all right. You don't have to get married, but you don't have to stay single either. This is your choice. Hebrews 13, 4, marriage is honorable. You're not being more righteous by staying single. Although there's some that would still teach that, that the holy men are priests, they're not supposed to marry. You know, some, some religions say their holy men can't marry. Well, that's those ordinances, doctrines of men, not of God. And you can have these things that you might feel about. Look, if you don't want to eat meat, don't eat it. You can't bind your scruple on others. Oh, but the Bible's so sensitive here. But if you know someone is really struggling with this, you be careful. You take care of your brother. Paul says, I won't eat meat. If my brother's going to stumble over that. I, so we look at it both ways, don't we? We've got to be careful not to bind our own scruples on others, but we've got to be sensitive toward others' scruples while they're growing in Christ so that we don't, don't cause them to stumble. So there's obligations here both ways. That just shows how Christianity is about looking after each other, isn't it? So, commanding to abstain from meats, and that gets us back where we were to start with, commanding to abstain from meats. I want to uh, extend the invitation. I wish I had a slide on this. I want to extend this invitation by reading this again like I did before Sunday school, and notice the faith. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith. Watch the faith. Let's follow this up now. The faith. What are we talking about? Look at verse 3. Them which believe and know the truth. The truth. You've got the faith. You've got the truth. Look down at verse 5. Sanctified by the word of God. The faith. The truth. The word of God. If you depart from the faith, you depart from the truth. You depart from the word of God. How do we make sure we have the right faith? How do we know it's the truth? It's the word of God. The word of God. Those are all tied together in that passage. 
And so what we want is God's Word. It will tell us what we must do to be saved. And tell us what we can and can't do now that we're saved. Not man. What God says about that. And then we stay with the Word of God. Then we stay with the faith. And we stay with the truth. So the invitation then is to become obedient to the faith. What's that mean? To obey the truth. What's that mean? Let's obey God's word. And if you're ready to do what God says, to turn from every other way, confess his name before men, and make that commitment, where you're baptized into Christ and then don't depart from it, then we extend the invitation as we sing the invitation song.